Now Italy is only half the story. Now we go to Germany. And Germany is a lot like Italy in the way they unify. Instead of a guy named Cavour, now we have a guy named Otto von Bismarck. And Otto von Bismarck is a very interesting character. He is the embodiment of Realpolitik because he was willing to do most anything in order to see his dreams realized. And the problem Germany was facing is that there were lots of independent states and there were really two choices of who they could unify behind. The question was, would it be the Habsburgs in Austria or would it be the Ho Hohenzollerns in Prussia? Bismarck was famous for saying some pretty incredible things. But one of the things he's most famous for, say, for saying is the great questions of the day will not be decided by speeches and re resolutions. That was the blunder of 1848 and 1849, but by blood and iron. And blood and iron are going to be what, what he's going to use in order to create a German state. Bismarck realized there were some things that had to be done within Prussia in order to make that the center of German unification. And so he embarked on a system to improve the country, to solidify the power of his king, Wilhelm I, and to improve the military, because military was going to be the key to the Prussian uh, unification of Germany. Well, again, we can look at unification in three key phases, but in the case of Germany, there are three key wars, the first of which is called the Prussian-Danish War. Now, look at the map here. Up in the north of Germany, well, it was in Germany at the time, there were two provinces that were controlled by Denmark. Otto von Bismarck's argument was that the people in these provinces spoke German, were culturally German, and therefore should be ruled by Germans. And so, he made an agreement with Austria in a joint venture to free them from Denmark's control. And they went in and they were immediately successful. They liberated the two areas, made them German, and then split the, the control of them. So Austria would control one and Prussia would control the other, which set the stage for phase two. In the second phase of German unification, Bismarck knew that he had to keep Austria out of the game. And so he started very carefully going around Europe and securing non-interference agreements with great powers like France and Russia. He didn't want them getting in the middle of this. He sold the idea that this was a local war and then created a small skirmish between those two provinces which had been taken away from Denmark in order to provoke Austria into a fight. What he thought was that if Austria and Prussia fought a war, that those different kingdoms of Germany, which were still independent, were going to have to choose sides. And he was right. And all of those, at least almost all of those territories in the north, which were not only Protestant after the, after the Protestant Reformation, but which were also looking towards Prussia as a stronger ally than, than Austria, jumped to the side of Prussia in the Austro-Prussian War. And in a very quick war, Prussia defeated the Austrians. Now, here's the genius. They gave them great, great peace terms. They walked away from this war fairly, on fairly good terms. They didn't ask for reparations. They didn't take away territory. They simply asked for two things. Number one, Austria had to give Venice over to the newly formed Kingdom of Italy. Number two, Austria had to stay out of German affairs. And they agreed. And thus, phase two was over. But the problem was, there were a few remaining territories, especially in the south, that still hadn't gotten behind the Prussian cause. And so Bismarck wondered, what could be done to bring them all together? In 1870, Bismarck came up with his answer. A war against a common enemy is going to bring everyone together. But he was having a real problem provoking a war with the one country that he thought would be the most likely to go to war with this Germany. 
that's France. And so, in a brilliant diplomatic move, he doctored a document which became known as the Ems Dispatch that made it look like a Prussian diplomat had personally insulted Napoleon III of France. Now, Napoleon III, being a Napoleon, being a Bonaparte, being who he was, can't be insulted by a German diplomat. And he it was so angry by this that he declared war. This gave Bismarck his openings. He called for a, for, for a unified front against France. All of the outlying kingdoms rallied to the cause. They invaded France. They very quickly beat France in a war. And then they ended it. But they didn't end it nicely like they did with the Austrians. Oh, no. Bismarck was going to sow the seeds of some deep hatred between France and Germany, which is going to last well into the 20th century. The defeat of France meant that the peace terms could be decided by Germany. And the peace terms were like this. Number one, France had to pay huge reparations for damage done during the war. This is going to create anger. Number two, the territories of Alsace and Lorraine, who the Germans argued were ethnically German, were going to be taken away and be part of the new German Empire. And speaking of the German Empire, number three, the new German Empire and the new head of the German Empire, Kaiser now, Wilhelm I, was crowned in the very symbol of French power, the Palace of Versailles, and not just that, but in the most magnificent room, the pride of Louis XIV, the German Empire was declared in the Hall of Mirrors. This is going to sit very badly with the French for a very long time. So now we come to the results of the whole thing, because we need to figure out why we care about these movements. Well, obviously, number one, we have unified countries now. Italy and Germany, since the beginning of our AP European study, have been fragmented, have been fighting within themselves, and have really been on the edges of the real power struggles in Europe. But now, they're unified countries who can provide unified fronts. Which brings us to number two. The balance of power, which had been in place since the Congress of Vienna, was now upset. Germany goes from being a not-so-huge power to being the most powerful country in all of Europe. And France, who is arguably one of, if not the most powerful country in Europe, is now humiliated. And number three, we have a change in the way things are done. The age of realism, the age of realpolitik, the age that you can make things happen if you plan them out the right way, has been ushered in. And that's going to change the way that Europeans act for a very long time. They're going to have to deal with this balance of power question. And the only thing that makes sense, that makes practical sense, is to start creating a system of alliances. But we'll get to that another time. Until next time, thanks for watching.